Experiencing the Essence of Prayer I don't understand. I disclose information that hasn't been told before. People say, we never heard such things. Where are you making all this stuff up from? I disclose information that has been told before. People say, you're just repeating stuff from the past. What should I do? Either I'm going to share things that haven't been told before or that have been. As I research, explore and investigate, I discover, understand and extract knowledge and I share this with people. Then they say, we've never heard of such things. Where are you making all this up from? For God's sake, it's just not possible to please anybody. Not that it's what I'm striving for. I don't want anything from anyone. All I'm saying is, here, take this information and try to understand it. Still, they criticize. Still, they bicker on. Let them. There's nothing I can do. I have come close to the end of my life. All I plan to do before I leave is to share what I know while I have the chance. I don't care what people say or think. Now, there is a terribly misunderstood topic that has to be addressed. Faith does not accept imitation. Faith is not for monkeys. The proposal of faith was not made to monkeys. There is an interesting verse in the Quran that says, We morphed the unbelievers into monkeys. When I read this in my youth, I used to wonder, did such tribes really exist? How did they turn into monkeys? Back then, of course, I used to take things very literally, incognizant of the metaphors and allegories. In time, as I researched and examined, I was able to discern the symbolism. Those who don't have faith, who don't ponder, who don't question or research the authenticity of things are exemplified as monkeys. Simply because monkeys are the most advanced species on earth at imitating, that is, the actions of monkeys are driven by imitation. So, people who don't contemplate on why they do what they do, who don't inquire or investigate, are like monkeys. They merely imitate others. A while ago I had written and talked about it. And thanks to Allah, perhaps we can see this as my wish coming true. Honda has invented a robot that performs the daily prescribed prayers. The Honda robot literally reads El Fatiha and performs Salat. It says Allahu Akbar, it bows and prostrates. One can't perform Salat like the Honda robot. One can certainly enact these moves, but quite obviously, this isn't the Salat prescribed in the Quran. The Quran says, so woe to those who pray, who are heedless of their Salat, meaning Woe unto those worshippers who are heedless of their prayer, who do not experience the quintessence of their salat, and are hence addressed as those who have no salat. Some say, oh, but such and such saintly person was such a holy man. He used to perform salat with 400 rakats in one night. What can I say? The Honda robot can pray vigorously too. I can program it so that it reads El Fatiha, followed by another short chapter, then bow, then stand, then prostrate, then read some more, all in one minute. It can perform 400 rakats in 400 minutes, six to seven hours in total. 
So think about it. If you were to routinely prostrate 400 times without any conscious connection, could this qualify as Salat? Rasulallah once saw a man praying in the mosque. The man was prostrating, standing, saying, Allahu Akbar, then prostrating again. Rasulallah told the man, You have not prostrated. One cannot prostrate like the pecking of a hen. One must prostrate in prostration. One must invocate and contemplate on the meaning of his invocation, then sit up. Come, my friends, let's give some serious consideration to what Salat really means. Salat, by essence, means an intimate turn. An inward, an intimate turn made utterly to Allah. Not to a deity, only to Allah. Who says? Master, Hadrat Ali, the Amir of the believers, and the zenith of sainthood, teaches this to us. The saints of the chain of the intimates extending from Hadrat Ali and those who have experienced the supremacy of the reality within their own souls have taught us the essence of Salat. These people lived and experienced the essence of Salat. But what does it mean to experience the essence of Salat? To live and experience the essence of Salat is to consciously contemplate on, to feel and experience within your brain every verse your mouth recites, and to discover their meaning within yourself. When you stand for Salat, You must stand to face the reality of Allah within. If you're not making this inward turn to your sustainer, then you cannot be doing Salat. When you're performing Salat and you recite the Besmele, what you're really saying is, the one whose name is Allah, who is Rahman and Rahim, is actually the essence and reality of my brain, my existence. This infinite existence is within the depths of my being. So, I stand here now to consciously feel and experience this reality. When you say, You mean only Allah, the sustainer of all worlds. The essence of all creation can duly know and evaluate himself. To glorify Allah is to acknowledge and admit that only Allah can evaluate his own existence. Because there is no other existence other than Allah. It is not possible for another being to evaluate Allah. Hence, glory belongs only to Allah. This must be felt in regards to the whole of creation. For we are talking about the sustainer of all the worlds. Who is the sustainer of all the worlds? All the qualities and activities of the names belonging to the existence denoted by the name Allah. The point of a name is the meaning that is indicated by it. That is, the meanings, qualities, and properties pertaining to that name. So, all the names of Allah 
are the origins and essences of the level of Rabuvia. Everything in manifestation, the whole of creation, is formed by these essences. To say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, is to feel, to observe and experience the truth. That the whole of existence has been formed with the qualities of your sustainer, your essence, your being. To experience this at various levels is to feel your share of the sustainer of all the worlds, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Rahman is the potential of the numerous qualities implied by the divine names. Therefore, the cosmos or the innermost potential of all the qualities within the cosmos expressed as the multitudinous creation is Rahman. One can only experience Rahman to the extent that one can observe these manifested qualities. Er Rahim, the merciful, comes from the Arabic word Rahim, which literally means the womb. It reproduces, forms, and manifests. The source of the transformation of everything within existence from its dormant potential state into its manifested form is Rahim. Hence, to observe the Rahim as the source of all existence is also to appreciate the saying, the worlds have been created with Allah's mercy and compassion. This is what one should contemplate on while saying, Er Rahman, Er Rahim, in Salat. Malikiyo Medin or Malikiyo Medin. Rasul Allah read this both ways. That is, the owner and commander of the system and order inherent in creation, which is active at all times. Malikiyo Medin means the Day of Judgment is actually every instant that Allah's system and order is valid and operative. The sovereign commander of every manifestation at every moment, every formation and creation, this reality must be felt and experienced in Salat. I'm only giving you a brief explanation here. How long will it take each individual to experience this in their salat? I can't say. Then we say, In a recent video, I had explained the processing of data in the brain, which results in the activation of a certain level of enlightenment and apprehension. I had said the process, projection, and enlightenment occurring in the brain is due to the divine realities and qualities within the depths of the brain. In other words, the essence and origin of the mechanism that we refer to as the brain are the divine names of the sustainer. Thus, the divine names are constantly in an act of creation in consonance with the data that is constantly received by the brain. Hence, we say, Iyaka na budu, that is, we serve only you. 
Note that it's we and not I, meaning here, there, everywhere. Everything is constantly in service to their sustainer. I.e., the names of Allah, which comprise the essence of their brain. By exhibiting the intrinsic properties of their own disposition, Wa eyaka nastayin, i.e., and we seek your help to pursue this service. So, if the names we talk about in reference to the level of rububiyah were not expressed, the higher levels of subitude could not come about. In all formations, will terminate. Every individual is a servant to the qualities of the names within his or her own essence. And in ensuing this, he or she is in constant need of the continued expression of Allah's names. Ich den Esrotal Mustaki. Guide us to the straight path. Give us true guidance. This transpires when an individual recognizes and becomes cognizant of his or her divine essence and begins to appraise and utilize this knowledge. The Sirat al Mustaqim is the guided path. Guidance takes place when an individual turns inwardly to his sustainer and feels his sustainer's existence within his or her own soul, thereby realizing his or her own nothingness and declaring only you exist. Prostration is the physical illustration of this realization. This is why we immediately prostrate after reading these verses in the upright position. So this is how we read El Fatiha. We said, Iyakana Budu, Ma Iyaka Nastain. We also said, Itinasirat al Mustaqim. Now, when we say, Zerot al Adhina in Umta Alehim, we're referring to Rasulallah and his intimates, Abu Bekish, and other magnificent individuals who have experienced this reality within their own souls. And we're beseeching to also have an experience of this divine bestowal. Gail Madubi Alahim Valadolin. Protect us from those who have procured your wrath. That is, those who are deprived of realizing and experiencing the reality of their essence, who think they are composed of only the body, who are deprived of connecting to their innermost sustainer, and therefore subject to the consequences of this incapacity. If we start expounding on the chapter Ali Klaas now, we will be here for a long time. Chapter Ali Klaas is a whole other topic on its own. So, let's move on. After reading these verses, we say, Allahu Akbash. This Allahu Akbash means beyond everything I have just read, beyond my understanding of my sustainer, 
based on the qualities of his names. There is an eternal sovereignty and magnificence that is far beyond my comprehension. Totally free and independent of the world, far beyond any conceptualization or form. That is the sustainer in the presence of whom I am now bowing. As for the meaning of bowing, previous to Islam, Salat was practiced, but the bowing component didn't exist. They used to stand in prayer. And then prostrate in prayer. As a mercy, the notion of bowing was introduced to the community of Muhammad as bowing symbolizes the admittance of knowing your nothingness at the level of intellect, but due to the inability of thoroughly comprehending and experiencing your nothingness, you bow in confession that you are at least at the awareness of your constant servitude to Allah. Previous practices of Salat were expressions of a complete experience of the reality of oneness and a renunciation of the self. But as a mercy to the followers of Muhammad, bowing was added. Bowing is a depiction of the following. You know and understand all of the above, but you are unable to totally eradicate your ego or assumed self. You still feel your existence as a separate entity, a physical manifestation of Allah's names. Nevertheless, your servitude is still valid and acceptable. There is also a general supplication that is made during bowing. That being, Supan Arabi al Generally conceived as supplicating to a sustainer who is Azim, great, meaning my sustainer is Azim, great, and Supan, glorious. But to say my sustainer is great and glorious, what you're really saying is, my sustainer, the one who exhibits all the properties in my brain, the one whose names constitute the essence of my brain. Whether you know the 99 names or the 1001 names, all of these names, qualities, properties, energies are all present at the core level of our brains. Thus, to turn to your sustainer isn't a turn that's made to a sustainer outside or in the heavens somewhere. There is no such sustainer, God, deity residing outside. The turn should be made to your very own essence. The sustainer that constitutes your very being. The common folk saying such as, prostrating to a believer is like prostrating to your sustainer, refers to the level of rebubia that encompasses the essence of all brains, the essence of all beings. So we say, Supan Arabi Alazim, as though to articulate and experience these infinite qualities at the level of rebubia but also keeping in mind the meaning of Supan. That is, yes, all of these qualities pertain to him, are revealed by him, created by him, but he is far beyond being conditioned or restricted by such disclosures. He is utterly untainted by such limitations, thus opening the door to infinity. That is, you open the door to infinite possibilities and articulate his greatness during bowing. If you're not contemplating these during bowing, then your action is not serving its purpose. 
And your bow is no different to the Honda robots one. How then can you actually think you are performing Salat? Turning to your innermost essence, you can go ahead and pray 50 times rather than the prescribed 5 if you like, or even 5,000 times. The robot too can be programmed to pray 4,000 times instead of 400. If you fail to contemplate on the meaning of the verses you recite, if you don't feel their reality within your very being, how can this prayer be valid? Then you say, Simi, Ullahu, Liman, Hamide, as you stand back up, Allah is Sami, all hearing. What this means is, with the Sami quality within my essence, my sustainer, the one in the depths of my brain's essence, is conscious and aware of my invocations. My sustainer hears my supplications and evaluates my comprehension and experience of these truths. Simi Allahu Liman Hamide is the maxim of the reality that the glorifications of the glorifier is heard. This is why we straighten our backs up again and assume the upright standing position while saying, i.e. glorification belongs utterly to you, oblivious of how the brain processes the incoming data, the reality can only be construed and comprehended by the qualities pertaining to the names that comprise the essence of the brain. And these qualities are constantly evaluating and creating the next phase. Means I am forever important of truly comprehending the expression, intensity, and perfection of your glory and majesty and their perfect disclosure via the processes of my brain. Because I am limited, my awareness is limited, and as such, unable to duly evaluate the unlimited reality of the sustainer that comprises my essence and incapable of apprehending the majesty of your sovereignty. At this point, you can't help but say, Allah is great and prostrate. Prostration is the expression of the following. O Allah, in respect to your existence, I am non-existent. I consist of nothing more than a name given to the manifestation of your qualities. The qualities that are exhibited by this name belong fully to you. Therefore, it is only you that exists. There is no such thing as I. There is only you. The most exalted and most perfect. I don't exist because I is the debris of the past. It is a virus inherited during the formation of the brain. The I virus contaminates all of the files by adding the my extension to them. So we start saying things like my kidneys, my liver, my lungs, my heart, my feet, my arms, my daughter, my son, etc. Why? As I explained previously during the brain's development, all of the data pertaining to the rest of the organs in the body are stored in the brain. 
Due to this accumulation of stored data associated to the body, the brain begins to regard itself as this physical body. So when a woman falls pregnant, because the baby begins to form inside of her body, her brain receives the data regarding the baby as though it is one of her organs. And just as she says, my liver, she starts saying, my child. For nine months, she gets conditioned with this information to say, my child. It's just as right and natural for her as saying, my liver. Even after the child is born and out of her body, it makes no difference. The data entry of my child remains in her brain. Just like a phantom limb situation, where a man's arm is amputated, but he still feels his arm. Anyway, these are lengthy topics, so let's not digress. I was talking about prostration and look at where I ended up. Old age is catching up on me. I am no longer able to follow the topics through. Anyway, in prostration, you renounce yourself and feel your nothingness. You declare the existence of your sustainer. You say, I am not, only you are. Then you sit up and read the prayer Muhammad read. You say, Wafwana, Wafvilana, Walhamna, Khadina. Have pity for me. For you are the most merciful. Your mercy upon me. Give me the cognizance with your mercy to connect to my essence, as this is the reality of mercy. And give me Hidayah, true guidance. Enable me to turn to you entirely and to annihilate myself within your existence. Of course, after making such a prayer, you automatically say, Allah is great, and prostrate once again. You are, I am not, I never was. It was always you, your names, your manifestations, and thus you complete the second prostration. I have tried to briefly explain the knowledge that has been passed on to us by Rasul Allah regarding Salat. This is how the prescribed five daily prayers mentioned as Salat in the Quran should be experienced according to my understanding. Actually, there is much more in-depth experiences of Salat. As it is said, Salat is the ascension of the believer, where ascension is ascension to Allah. This ascension is what one must live and experience in their Salat. Otherwise, it is not a Salat, but a ritual. And a ritualistic prayer is no more valuable than the mechanic moves of the Honda robot. The verses are recited as though from a tape. The invocations and supplications are repeated mechanically. The bowings and prostrations are done as though doing gymnastics. There is no spiritual experience. Whereas Salat is something that is experienced. That is why it is known as the pole of faith. What does pole of faith mean? It means our sense of existence within the order and system of Allah is solely for the purpose of us discerning our essence and living our lives accordingly. If we fail to live at this consciousness, then our faith is invalid. Faith isn't about repeating certain mystical words, sentences, tales, or laws and regulations. Faith is the origin and essence of existence. It is Allah. 
It is the awareness of Allah exists. I don't. It is to feel and experience this reality, not to verbalize it. Those who learn and memorize religious words constantly repeat these words for self-gratification without ever experiencing its spirit. And as such, they pursue their lives based on their physical bodies and its desires and pleasures, thus becoming the followers of the Antichrist. As for the awaited Mahdi, Savior, it is the enlightenment that comes with this knowledge. If you can apprehend this knowledge, then your Mahdi has come. Otherwise, you will die without seeing the Mahdi. If you are at this consciousness and you are living this reality, then the Mahdi has reached you. I have no business with a Mahdi that is supposed to come from the outside somewhere. Mahdi is the true guidance that comes to you from your sustainer. Next, we'll talk about the essence of fasting.